praise you, Father. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Sing that with us. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus And every war he wages he will win Oh, I'm not backing down from any giant Cause I know how this story ends I know, I know how this story see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin king, the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
Till the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe before the souls of all who died, till the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're 
that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Who you are, Lord, you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, that. Lord, it's so good to be able to come this morning on a beautiful sunny morning in Red Deer to say we love you, we worship you. You alone are worthy. Thank you that you've been working on our lives. Boy, when we were in our our mother's wombs, Father, you just keep working, you keep changing, you keep loving us, and you keep working with us, Father. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the world, even in this strange situation, Father. You're working good. You're working good things out of bad situations, Father. Thank you that we can come this morning and give you praise and give you adoration and give you glory. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. And I'm Jen, and we just wanted to come and say welcome to you guys this morning. Whether you're new or regular attenders, we love seeing you guys out. Thank you for getting connected with us. Hannah, do you want to talk a little bit more about how they can get connected? I do. (laughs) So there's a lot still happening in the life of our church right now, and we really do want to see you get connected and plugged in here. And so if you follow the link below the video, it'll take you to our church website. There you can find all of the ways to get plugged in and get connected into the life of the church and connect with the body of Christ. There's also a button there that says get connected go ahead and click on that let us know if there's been any changes to your information or if you're new here but also let us know praise reports you have during this time prayer requests we really do want to get in touch with you and just have a chance to pray with you and then also on the church website is our give button so you can hit that to give of your tithes and offerings today awesome we're about to move into our message so stay tuned we'll see you guys after Well, good morning and welcome to Living Stones Church. I know some of you are from Red Deer, but we have people viewing from around the world right now, and that's exciting. I want to just start by reading a little bit from Psalm 143. 
And I want to just encourage us today that we're living in an unusual moment. And let's just listen to what the psalmist says here. He says, answer me quickly. I'm, I'm reading from Psalm 143, verse 7. Answer me quickly, Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for my, I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God, and may your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. You know, this past week I've been reminded, you know, and was doing a lot of thinking about what's occurring in our lives at this moment. You know, with COVID-19, with all of these restrictions, I believe there's been such a loss of freedom that so many people are walking through the experience called grief. Because every time you have loss, you have grief. We, we're grieving right now, and it's very natural to feel sadness. And for some people, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're irritated, they're upset. And uh, those are all normal human emotions in times of loss. And folks, we've lost something. We've lost life as we once knew it. It's changed right now. And uh, especially as North Americans, we're used to this amazing freedom, and now our freedoms have been curtailed. And so there's just uh, difficulty in our emotions. And I was chatting with someone today, and they were just sharing how sad they were with me, and I wanted to, I just had to say, listen, this is a very normal human emotion. And so I think that's important that we recognize that. And maybe some of you have been going through that. You've been feeling it in your heart. You go, you know, I feel good some moments, and then all of a sudden, I feel sad for no reason. No, there is a reason. We're walking through a time of grief, and you're grieving, and that's what it, grief is like. It's not even rational sometimes but we've lost this freedom, a loss of freedom to worship like we once were allowed to do that. And yet, because of this uh, emergency situation, and I know some people, you may not agree with what's going on. It doesn't really matter. This is the way life is right now. So what I want to do this morning is pray that God would bring special grace into our lives and to recognize God is in control. Do you know that? God is in control of our lives. He's in control of this situation. And I believe God is going to, as we sang earlier in our service, God is going to take what is meant for evil, and what's he going to do? He's going to use it for good. And I believe that with all of my heart. So let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that you are a good and gracious Father, that you love us with an everlasting love, that your plans and desires and aspirations for us, your children, are always good. And so I pray today that you would bring great grace into our hearts, great hope into our lives. I pray that you would address the emotions in our soul. Help us to recognize these are normal like, uh, feelings, Lord, but we're not allowing our feelings to define our lives, as we're going to hear this morning. Circumstances do not define us as your child, but our eyes are fixed on you. Our hearts do not have to be heavy. They don't have to be troubled. They don't have to be filled with anxiety because we're looking to you, Father, knowing that you have but grace and joy and love reflected towards us. And I pray today as we hear your word, it's a very instructive word, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear, a heart to receive, not just to hear these words, but to actually put them into practice so that we can experience the benefits of your wise counsel, Father. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. So we're turning back to the book of Proverbs. We're doing a series out of that book. And uh, we're in chapter 13. We're gonna look at what does it mean to live a disciplined life or a wise life. And I raise the question, who are the heroes of our day? 
Now, I think we're starting to shift a little bit because in the past, we kind of looked at sports icons and movie stars to be the heroes or at least the people people are looking up to. But all of a sudden now, we're starting to see the real heroes are emerging, you know, people that are caring for us, people that are meeting our needs and serving us. We're starting to see them as the ones that are the true heroes in our world. Oftentimes, young people want to try and emulate people that they look up to. And it could be a sports icon, or they, maybe it's someone they think is extremely cool. But the mentor generally is someone that I believe is like a parent. And a lot of young people look to their parents to mentor them. And they're the ones that they're trying to please. Now, Harry Ironside reminds us that it is true wisdom to realize that the more experienced person may save us much heartache and failure by instructing us as a result of what has been learned on a road already traveled and which to us is all new ground. Isn't that true that we want to, you know, follow someone who's had some experience? We've never been this way before, but here's someone who's already walked that trail. And I believe if we can learn from them and avoid some of their pitfalls, that is wisdom. He goes on to say, the self-confident scorner will pass on, indifferent to the words of the wise, to learn from themselves by bitter experiences the snares and pitfalls they may have been saved from had they been humble enough to accept counsel from those competent to teach them. Isn't that true? That we can actually learn from other people. But you know, sometimes we get a little stiff neck. We don't want to hear from anybody. We don't want to learn from others, and so we succumb to the problems because we just weren't wise enough to listen. So when we think of discipline, you know, we think of that discipline that comes from outside of a person. You know, usually when we're children, we need discipline. We need the instruction. We need to have boundaries set in our life so that we can grow into mature people. And then there's the ultimate form of discipline that God brings into our lives. And as you and I yield to them, God starts to work into our life to discipline us so that he can shape us into the person of Jesus Christ. And hopefully there's a willingness on our part to embrace it and learn from it. Without learning to receive discipline, well, then we get into all kinds of trouble. But if we can learn it, I think the goal is to teach us to become self-disciplined, right? And I think that's true in society that we want young people to grow up so that they learn to discipline themselves. Because we recognize that disciplined people are usually people who succeed in life. But when I speak of self-discipline, I want to just maybe modify our understanding of that idea. Because what I'm thinking about is not just the discipline that, you know, you and I can impose on ourselves, but I'm talking about being able to surrender to and be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Because one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control or self-discipline. So now we're living now a self-empowered and a self-controlled life. So... As we look at this vantage point today, we're going to look at what motivates people to discipline themselves. And I believe the fuel that motivates us to really discipline ourselves is desire. Isn't that true? So if you desire something, you're you're more willing to discipline yourself. I was kind of watching these cute little takes on Facebook. Some of the families were doing something with their little ones, you know, about two or three years old, and they'd put a little bowl of M&Ms in front of them, and the mom would say to them, now, if you don't eat any of these for the next few minutes, when I come back, you can have some. And it was so fun to watch the faces of these little children, you know, as they're trying to discipline themselves from reaching in and taking a candy before they're supposed to. And isn't that all part of learning? And they've done studies to show that people who can discipline themselves tend to be more successful in life than those who are unable to do that. But I think desire is the fuel. So this effect of living a life under the discipline of godly instruction actually helps facilitate a disciplined life, which in turn brings amazing blessings into our lives and it moves us all the way into eternity. So now as we open up the chapters of Proverbs, there's a continuous appeal for us to hear the words of wisdom and it challenges us to respond to wisdom's instruction in a positive way rather than just dismissing it. So let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 13 and verse one. It says, a wise son, we could say a daughter, wise son or daughter, they heed or listen to their parents' instruction, a father's instruction, but a mocker does not respond to rebukes. 
So here we're seeing a contrast between those who listen to instruction and in the word instruction in the Hebrew language, it also has the idea of correction with it. And then we notice here the mocker who will not respond positively to instruction and correction. And what Proverbs 13 illustrates is a number of areas in our lives that God's instruction is given so that we can make wise decisions or live a self-disciplined life. And in turn, not only will it impact us, but it begins to impact the lives of people around us. So I wanna take a look at four realms where blessings flow from living a disciplined life or what we would call a wise life. And the first realm that I wanna look at is in the area of our speech or with our mouth. How many know that our words really get us into troubles? Anybody here experience that? It's probably the most difficult member of our body to tame, the Bible says. As a matter of fact, James, from the book of James, James was the half-brother of Jesus. James actually is someone who's really deeply uh, embedded with this wisdom literature in his mind. And you can pick that up when you read the book of James. As a matter of fact, James chapter three, verse two, he says this, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect or mature, able to keep their whole body in check. In other words, he's describing a person who's living a very disciplined life. You know, it's the discipline of keeping our mouths shut. How many know that's kind of hard sometimes? He, later on, he goes on to say in verse six, he says, the tongue is also a fire, speaking of our mouth, our words, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow, that's pretty strong language. What he's saying is we have to be careful, I mean, because uh, what's inside is gonna pop out, and a lot of times the stuff we say may not be the right things to say. And part of that is learning to restrain or discipline our lives. Matter of fact, James goes on to say in chapter one and verse 19, he says to be slow to speak. As a matter of fact, when you read through Proverbs, you'll, you'll notice it talks about and values the restraint of words. How many know it's probably important to think before you talk, right? Has anybody ever had that problem, you spoke before you thought, kind of gets you into trouble? So now we're being taught here, listen, don't say anything until you've thought out what you're about to say. He goes on to say, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The words we speak are absolutely powerful. What we say or don't say and how we say it is indicative of what's really happening inside of us. Words are one means of determining the kind of person we are. Not only does it reveal our character, but it also will impact our state and future. Our words can bring blessing and our words can bring curses. And how many here have been wounded by words? Anybody here been wounded by words? Every hand should be up. I think words really cut. They really do a lot of damage. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I remember years ago watching a movie by, about the story of Karen Carpenter, and a thoughtless word said by a DJ over the radio about her weight actually facilitated a problem with anorexia in her life just because she was so self-conscious about her weight. And one little comment, comment, just a careless word actually brought great harm into her mind. And I, I'm just gonna encourage us that we would really look at what we're saying, because that's powerful. Now, as we take a look here in chapter 13, we see how powerful words really are. And beginning in verse two, it says, from the fruit of their lips, people enjoy good things, but the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. It's almost like here we have you know, the mouth, you know, an appetite for violence. They're eating it, you know. And then it says, gracious wor words, oh, sorry, verse three, it says, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. And, you know, I can think of stories even in the Bible. Remember Shimei, who uh, was cursing David when he left the city, and then eventually Solomon took over as king, and Solomon, you know, you know, there's all of these rash things that people say. Remember, he was cursing David. So when David was about to depart, he said to Solomon, keep an eye on this guy. You know, you can't really trust him. And so Solomon made uh, an agreement with him that he could never leave the city. And then one day he did, and then all of a sudden he lost his life. So rash words can cause problems in our lives. Bruce Walkie points out the wise have open ears 
and closed mouths, where the foolish have closed ears and open mouths. How many can see the difference? So what is he saying to us? He's saying, listen, you know, we need to listen more and speak less. And that's what James is re referring to there in chapter 1 and verse 19. Proverbs 16, 23 says it this way, the heart of the wise make their mouths prudent. In other words, we have a responsibility to set a guard upon our lips. You know, I love that psalm. It says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Lord, we need to be prudent in what we say. And their lips promote instruction. Very next verse, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. How many have ever had someone speak just the right word in a time of pain in your life and brought comfort and hope and encouragement to you? And isn't that the kind of you know, words that we want to communicate to other people? We want to literally build people up. We want to strengthen people by the words of our mouth. So what kind of words are flowing from my lips and your lips? Are they words filled with anger and accusation, or are they words filled with encouragement and hope that desires to build others up? You know, back in 1675, this was like nine years after the great fire in London, Sir Christopher Wren, some of you may recognize his name, very uh, significant architecture, uh, he laid the foundation stone, what was to be his greatest architectural enterprise, the building of St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul is where, you know, the, the royals in England get married. Okay, and it took him 35 long years to comp complete this task. And when it was done, he waited breathlessly for the reaction of Her Majesty Queen Anne. And here's, here's what happened. Here's the words that she spoke to him. After being carefully shown through the structure, she summed up her feelings for the architecture in three words. It's awful. It's amusing. And it's artificial. Now... As we look at those words today, we would go, wow, that would be deflating, wouldn't it? But isn't it interesting how words change their meaning? And in 1710, the word awful actually meant awe-inspiring. And the word amusing meant amazing. And the word artificial meant artistic. So what to our ears might have sounded like a devastating criticism were in that time words of measured praise. Let me move on to the second realm where blessings flow from a disciplined life or a wise life. Not only does it flow from our mouths, but it's seen in how we acquire or respond to money. It's interesting. What is our attitude toward money? Is money something we use to enrich our lives, but is not seen as a tool to bring glory to God and to help others as well? Do we acquire money at the expense of others? Or is our attitude towards money speaks of volumes of where we're really putting our trust? Is money the ultimate source of our security? And what should our attitude towards money be? Because how many think this is an area we have to get disciplined? It's getting really quiet, you know. It's really an amazing thing. And I would even say this is probably a message that even government leaders need to listen to because I think this is an important area. We need to learn to be disciplined. A proper means of acquiring money is an important ingredient in living a wise and disciplined life. Look at Proverbs 13, 11. Dishonest money dwindles away. But whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. See, now the wisdom literature is never speaking against wealth. But it's always speaking about what we put our trust in and also how we acquire it. And it's an important element in the disciplined life. Bruce Walke says the Proverbs argue for the accumulation of wealth through virtue and not through get-rich-quick schemes and vice. And by weighing the scales at the end of the day. Gotten by unsound means basically means the word in Hebrew uh, Mehebel just means a puff of air or vapor. And he says it's often used meta metaphorically for what lacks permanence. As a matter of fact, uh, the, this metaphor of getting money from a vapor suggests what English speakers call easy money, including tyranny, injustice, extortion, lies, and windfalls at the expense of others. Instead of these windy methods... The book prescribes a substantial method of patience, diligence, prudence, generosity, and faith, virtues that have stood the test of time. What is he really telling tell us here? 
He's saying basically we need to be diligent. We gather monies little by little. We are patient about it. We show generosity. These are all characteristics of a godly and a wise life, a disciplined life. There are other Proverbs that support 13.11, like Proverbs 12.11. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. How many know a lot of people are chasing fantasies? They have all these ideas on how to make money fast. He says, stay away from those ideas. They don't work. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs 28, 19, and 20, it says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. A faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. So what we are discovering is that meaning in life is not secured by possessing things, but finding purpose that is significant and meaningful in life. A number of years ago, I read a book by Larry Crabb entitled Inside Out, and as I was working on this message, I remembered some things that tied into my thinking here as I was working through this message. And he was talking about longings or desires that fuel our lives, and he says, to say I long for respect does not put the matter too strongly. He says, I long to know that someone sees something in me that's valuable, that my existence is important uh, because I'm capable of making a difference. Many people refer to this longing as a desire for significance, or more specifically, personal meaningfulness. And so what, what some people do is they actually look for money as to meet that need for significance and meaning, but the reality is that's not what we're longing for deep within our souls. As a matter of fact, true se security is gonna never be found in money. It's always found in righteousness. And here in this chapter of Proverbs, we see the limitations of wealth as expressed in verses eight and nine. It says here, Proverbs 13, eight, a person's riches may ransom their life, but the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. In other words, they don't have the resources to do it, but there's another way to look at this verse. The light of the righteous shines brightly, but the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. While the rich may be able to pay for their ransom if they are kidnapped, the poor rare, rarely get kidnapped because they don't have any resources. It's not worth the while of the kidnapper, so they just leave the poor alone. Tremper Longman says, while this seems an argument in favor of the power of riches, the second colon undermines it. If the person were poor, there would be no chance of kidnapping in the first place. And I agree with that. What would be the use? In the final analysis, wealth is not really the protection that it purports to be. Old Testament scholar Ernest Lucas ties verses eight and nine together to drive the point that it's actually righteousness that is the most important element in a disciplined life. The word light in verse nine is a metaphor for life force. And what he means by that is if you read Proverbs 20, 20, it says if someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. And then verse a Proverbs 24, 20, it says, for the evildoer has no future hope and the lamp of the wicked will be stuffed off. So how many can see now the light is actually talking about our souls or the essence of our being? In other words, that's the end of us. So he goes on to say, taken in its context, this general statement is a, co is a comment on the previous verse. True security is not in either wealth or poverty, but actually in righteousness. Let me move on to the third realm where the disciplined life impacts. It's in our level of contentment. And really when we get down to it, when you talk to people, what is it you really want in life? And most people will say, I just want to be happy, right? Isn't that, the, isn't that probably the right answer? And I believe that that's what God is uh, wanting to get across to us, that you and I can actually find happiness. Jesus actually teaches us in the Beatitudes the, the road to happiness. That's what Beatitude means. It's the attitudes we need to have in order to experience this Happiness. That's why Jesus says, blessed is the person. That word blessed in the Hebrew language actually is the word happy. It's the word asher. He's basically saying, this is how you become happy. Wow, isn't that neat? So we have a road towards happiness given by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 5 at the beginning of that chapter. But let's take a look here where our hopes and dreams now become reality. And I think this is now speaking, in this chapter speaking, not just to a disciplined life, but he's speaking to our longings and our desires. Because remember I said earlier, desires or longings are the fuel that actually help us live this discipline or wise life. In chapter 13, verse 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And then in verse 19 of the same chapter, he says it this way, a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but fools detest turning from evil. Now, I think we've all had those moments when we've had a longing fulfilled or we've had a desire come to pass. How many know when we have those moments, we just got to tell people the good thing that God's done in our life. Isn't that true? How many of you ever had that moment where something awesome has happened? You're so excited, you want to tell somebody about it. You know, just this week, you know, Rachel phones us up. This is my daughter, and she's so excited because she just received her uh, permanent teaching certificate. Oh, that was so neat. She had, she, yeah, she was excited about that. So that's a, that's a moment of, you know, a longing fulfilled, right? A desire fulfilled. Hey, I have, I've achieved this element. That's exciting. And then, but then there are other seasons in life where our hope is deferred, where, where circumstances and difficulties enter into our lives, right? Doesn't that kind of, as verse 12 says, it kind of makes life even more challenging. It makes the heart sick, it says. And I, you know, I think of times when you know, faithful people discover terrible things. You know, I was looking, you know, even sometimes in the church we only celebrate the victories, but how about when, when somebody's sitting there and they come to church on a Sunday morning and maybe they've been faithful to discover that you know, they have cancer. You know, they're saying to themselves, well, God, I've been faithful all these years. Why did you allow this into my life? Or maybe a spouse of 30 years leaves them for someone else. How crushing and devastating is that experience? And then they start wondering, what did I do to deserve that? right? So it's not just in, in life that we have all these awesome moments, and I'm a Christian now, and I only have the benefits of life, but there are also those challenging moments, you know, or our job comes to an end, or as we're all experiencing the restrictions that come because of a medical emergency called COVID-19, and then all of our lives have been changed or diminished in some way, and isn't that true? Our lives have been diminished in some way, and so we feel it very deeply, you know, and our hearts are sick over it. And I, and I notice that. I'm, I'm working with people. I'm hearing the cry, the anguish, the sorrow, the sadness, and even the anger that this has brought into our lives. And I think we're all experiencing this measure of grief, as I said earlier, over the loss of life as we were experiencing without these restrictions. So many of our freedoms now have disappeared. So what did Jesus mean when he said he's come to give us life and that more abundantly? I mean, what does that really mean? that we would walk through life and never experience a problem? No, because Jesus said in the world you'll have trouble, you'll have tribulation, you'll have difficulty. But he says be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. What is he assuring us of? He says my presence will always be with you. This is the comfort that you and I have. This is the reason why you and I do not have to allow circumstances to de uh, determine how we're gonna live out our lives. Yes, we may have momentary moments where uh, we may have these moments where emotions, you know, overwhelm us, maybe a sense of loss or grief in our life. We may feel sad. We may even feel angry at times. Maybe we feel indifferent. Circumstances do affect our emotions, but it does not have to rob us of joy. Wow. As a matter of fact, I love the fact that we can have contentment no matter what the circumstance. You know, one of my favorite chapters, I, I think this might be my, my, one of my all-time favorite chapters in the sense that how to apply it to life is found in Philippians chapter four. I love Philippians four. Philippians four reminds us, especially in verses 11 through 12, that we can, can find contentment in any and every circumstance in life. Paul says it, I've learned the secret to be content. I know what it's like to have much, I know what it's like to have less. I know what it's like to lack. Isn't that an interesting statement? I've learned the secret of contentment. Paul, please tell us, what is the secret of contentment? And it's found in verse 13, and it's a verse many of us probably have memorized, and we've applied it to many situations. But listen to what it says. I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength. He's speaking of having contentment no matter what the circumstances. So what am I going to encourage us to do today? I'm telling you right now that you and I can have joy. You and I can have contentment. You and I can celebrate in the midst of loss because we have Christ giving us strength. What a huge advantage. That's the abundant life. Well, 
I think Larry Crabb in his book Inside Out says it so well when he says disappointment is a chronic reality for self-aware Christians. And he says there's at least three reasons for it. He says number one reason is that the complete joy of God will not be ours until heaven. Well, that's an interesting statement. Right now, we have only a deposit in the person of the Holy Spirit. I, I added that. So, you know, here's the problem. What we want right now is heaven on earth. Let's all be honest. I want heaven on earth. Isn't that true? But that's promised to us. So we get a little taste of it because we have the Holy Spirit in our life. Number two, he says, no relationship on earth is perfect. I mean, you know, that's true. That's right. I mean... We can have great relationships, and I, I am so blessed. I have so many great relationships in my life, but there can come moments of misunderstanding. Anybody ever have a moment of misunderstanding? Of course. You know why? Because we're still sinners, saved by grace. I know you could say, well, we're saints, pastors. Uh, yeah, I know we're saints, but you know what? There's always a need for forgiveness. Anybody have to practice forgiveness? Aren't you glad the Lord taught us how to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us? How many know people are going to sin against us? i got to practice forgiveness. You've got to practice forgiveness. And you know, sometimes I need to be forgiven. Anybody here ever need to be forgiven? Not just by God, but by others. You know, done some stupid things, said some dumb thing, had a wrong attitude? Of course. And then naturally, he says, fallen people naturally but wrongly depend on sources other than God. Isn't that the truth? Sometimes we depend on the government. Oops, did I say that? Of course I did. Because I think a lot of people do do that. Or they depend on money or well-behaved children or you know, great churches or loving mates or successful careers to find satisfaction for their crucial longings. But how many know that you know, in doing that, what we have really done is add unnecessary groaning to the acute pain of frustrated demands? What he means by that is simply this, that unrealistic expectations become unrealized ones. You see, you and I can have a realistic expectation. A realistic expectation is God will never leave me nor forsake me. A realistic expectation, well, you know, God's going to take care of me no matter what the situation is. God's not going to desert me. He's not going to drop me off. Even when I mess up, God's not going to stop loving me. And he's not going to start stop caring for me. He's not going to stop being there for me. I'm so thankful for that. And I also have a hope that transcends this life. That's the most beautiful thing in the world. And yet, the wise, godly, disciplined life, as the sages realized, brought greater blessings, brought greater joy, brought more abundant material prosperity than a life usually lived in an ungodly, wicked state. But then there were the exceptions. How many know that? Sometimes we say, hey, I'm doing the right thing and I'm getting a bad outcome, and then there's somebody that's doing the bad stuff and getting a good outcome. How do I handle those exceptions? And that's why Proverbs are not promises, but rather principles. And so I look at another wisdom section of the Bible, something like Psalm 73, verse 2, and it says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly, nearly lost my foothold. And then he goes on to say this in verse 3, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he spends verse after verse, you know, bemoaning the fact that this wicked person is doing so good and they're doing so poorly and you know, they're, they're succeeding and they're not the guys whining and crying because, you know, life isn't working out. And then he gets to verse 16, and when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. And then the turning verse, verse 17, until I entered, he says, the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. Oh, this is only short-lived. How many know that's true? Well, let me turn to the final uh, realm where blessings flow from a discipline or a wise life. First of all, we looked at it in the words we speak. We look at it in the way we trust or handle or acquire money. We looked at the idea of being contented, but now look at our future destiny. How life turns out is a combination of two things. One, God's sovereignty, and number two, our decisions or God's gift of freedom to make choices. Now, I know some people have a problem with that. Some people focus, you know, almost entirely on the sovereignty of God. Other people focus almost entirely on the freedom of man. I want to say there's a blend in life of the two. But let me point this out. 
Why does God allow evil? Isn't that a great question? And so many people ask that. And the simplest answer is that he created us like himself with volition, which means the ability to make choices. And how many know if you give somebody the ability to make choices, they can make the wrong one? How many know that's true? And I've noticed something. God doesn't rush out of heaven. He goes, no, no, you can't do that. It's the wrong choice. I think God tells us it's the wrong choice in his word. I think God warns us. God, you know, speaks into our life through his words. The Holy Spirit would put checks in our soul and say, hey, what do you think you're doing? I think people might come along that are wonderful believers and say, hey, what are you doing? But in the end, we're still making choices. And what happens is God allows us freedom to make mistakes and to commit sins and then to reap the devastating consequences of them. And how we end up in life is determined by a number of factors, but one of them is certainly the people we choose to spend time with. I mean, that's true. As a matter of fact, listen to what Proverbs 13, 20 says. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. That's powerful. I always put down, we may, be, may not be able to choose our family, but we can certainly choose our friends. Isn't that true? And the people we choose has a huge bearing on our life because the people we're hanging with affects our thinking and eventually affects our behavior. And the Apostle Paul obviously picked up on this proverb because I hear it echoed in the New Testament when Paul says this to the Corinthians. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So who are the wise that Proverbs talking about? Well, they're the people who fear God. They're the people who want to do what's right in God's sight. In brief, we can say they're the wise. They're the godly. They're the disciplined people. And one of the characteristics of a wise, godly, and disciplined person is that they hate evil. And you know where that hating of evil begins? Not in my neighbor's life. You know? No, it begins in my own soul. We should begin to hate the sin in our own lives and say, you know, these are the things I need to work on. These are the things that keep tripping me up. These are the areas I need to be focusing in on. And I'll tell you, if you start working on yourself, you'll be a lot more charitable to other people. Because how many have discovered that change is difficult? And especially when you're trying to change yourself. You know, it's so easy to tell other people to smarten up. You got to talk to your own soul in the morning. Say, hey, buddy, you got to smarten up. Get your act together, you know, right? Isn't that true? Sure. Then there are a number of Proverbs here that teach that words of correction often come from the mouth of the wise. You know, maybe that's why when we're doing the wrong thing, we don't want to hang around the wise because they might tell us what we're doing isn't right. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs 27, 6. It said, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That's a powerful statement. What's he saying? You know, a lot of times people say, yeah, it's okay, do the bad thing, but they're really not your friend. But a real friend will say, you know, what are you doing? It's going to destroy your life and mess you up. And then it says, whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. Isn't that an interesting statement? Let me just repeat that. Those who disregard discipline despise, not the person who's giving it, though they might, but they're really despising themselves. But the one who heeds correction gains understanding. And the consequence of one's relational attachments. Proverbs 13, 20 states both a positive and a negative outcome. Those who associate with the wise become wise. Those who are companion of fools, and you say, who are the fools? Those are the people that are saying no to God. Those are the people that are pushing God away. It says, you're gonna suffer harm. Now the next two Proverbs spell out the harm that will befall someone who refuses to listen to this discipline or wise counsel. In verse 21, it says, Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Ernest Lucas points out in verse 21, the retribution principle. Retribution simply means I do this, this is the consequence I get. In the unusual form that what people pursue actually is pursuing them. Isn't that an interesting thought? Let me go back and look at that verse. It says trouble pursues the sinner. If the sinner is causing trouble, trouble will chase after that person. I don't know about you, but I want to avoid trouble. I don't want it pursuing me. 
It says, so that they get what they deserve. In a society where there was no clear idea of life beyond death. See, this whole idea of resurrection and life beyond death, that's more of a New Testament idea. Yeah, there was shadings of it in the Old Testament, but really, as a dominant feature, that's really expressed in the New Testament. It's really developed there. The seeds are in the Old Testament, but the full expression of it is in the New Testament. It says, in a society where there was no clear idea of life beyond death, it was particularly important to leave a good inheritance to future generations. The good person is assured that this will be so, whereas the sinners warned that in some unspecified way, the wealth they accumulate will not benefit their descendants but pass on to the righteous. Wow. This provided one answer to the apparent injustice of sinners sometimes gaining wealth. In other words, matters would be sorted out in future generations. What is he saying? He's basically saying, you know what? The way you live and what you've acquired and accumulated is going to be passed on. But who's it going to be passed on to? You, can, you and I can't control that once we're dead. So how can I live a disciplined life? It's a great question. I'm glad you're asking that question because you can see the value of it. I think you and I have to be open to God. You have to open your heart and surrender to the work of the Spirit in your life. And I believe desire is what fuels or shapes discipline. You know, people who really want to be good at something, they spend a lot of time honing their craft. Isn't that the truth? Why do they discipline themselves? Because of the desire that's set before them. How did Jesus endure the cross? For the joy that was set before him. You see, desire shapes the ability to discipline our lives. How we respond to instruction and correction will impact what you and I eventually become. We all act on desires. If we desire God, we'll end up with him. How many think that's beautiful? If you desire God with all your heart, you'll end up with him. Isn't that a beautiful thought? You know, what is hell? The absence of God. And you know, there's some people who want nothing to do with God. Well, they're going to get their desire. They'll have nothing to do with him. We find meaning, hope, and ultimately our faith will be strengthened and rewarded. If we desire the things of this world, we'll ultimately be disappointed. Why? Because the things in this world are temporal, and they're, pa they're fading. They're passing away. Isn't that interesting? But if you're desiring that which is unseen, spiritual, they're eternal, and you're going to reap what you're desiring. <clears throat> so what does the discipline life produce? It shapes our character. It impacts our words. It helps us use the things in this world like money as a tool rather than allowing it to become a false substitute for God. The wiser disciplined life ends by producing contentment and ultimately a satisfied life because we have an eternal hope. You know, we do this program here called Alpha. I love it. And I still remember this one quote by Jim Carrey. He's a comedian and many of you know who he is. And he says something very profound. He says, I wish everyone in the world could gain the wealth and fame, could gain wealth and fame, because then they would learn these things do not bring true happiness. Although the Apostle Paul endured so much hardship and difficulty in this world, we find his amazing final words to his protege, Timothy, who was like a son to him. And what did, what did Paul pass on to him? He didn't pass on a million dollars. He didn't pass on a whole bunch of material things. You know what he passed on? A legacy of a life well lived. He passed on what it meant to be a man of God and a man of faith. He passed on an, an amazing legacy of faith. And I want you to hear the final words of the Apostle Paul, who lived the wise and disciplined life. And I love these verses. And this is what Paul says at the end. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then he says this. Now there is stored up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who long for his appearing. You know, I believe the deepest longing of every human heart will only be satisfied in knowing God. That's the ultimate answer to the ache, the longing, the desire in every heart. And you and I can experience that if we make God the goal. 
If we say, I want to know you, because I believe if, if we make that our pursuit, and we make that the goal, and we make that the desire, and we begin to listen to his word and discipline our life by the help of God's spirit, we're going to get there. We're going to get there just like Paul promised. So may we also embrace the words of instruction and correction. May we embrace this disciplined life that God's called us to. Let's stand. So I want to pray for us today. I know that we're living in an unusual time, but what a great, great time to hear a message like this, that you, you and I cannot just let our emotions get a hold of us and make emotional decisions right now. I still remember, you know, a message I preached quite a few years ago, and I entitled it, and I even wrote a blog on it called Managing Our Emotions. And I talked about God and how God was angry with his people. He was so mad he wanted to destroy them. But I like the way Eugene Peterson states it in the message in Ezekiel chapter 20. He said, but I didn't act out of my emotions. I acted out of who I am. And God said, I forgave them. And I did a work in their lives. And I am so glad that God doesn't act out of his emotions towards us when we do stupid things. I'm glad that God acts out of who he is, his character. And folks, that's what God is interested in. He's interested in producing godly character inside of us so that our emotions do not have to define our lives. And especially when we're in a time of difficult circumstance, our emotions do not have to rule us. But we can have, find our strength. And we're able to say like the Apostle Paul, I've learned to be content in any and every circumstance because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I want to pray today for you. Maybe you're struggling emotionally during this time. I'm going to ask God to pour his strength into your soul. Maybe you're here today saying, you know, there is such a longing in my heart and I have been pursuing things and they're the wrong things and I can see that now they're just temporal and they'll soon pass and fade away. But I want to encourage you to make God the goal and to get on that road and begin to follow him and to allow his spirit to begin to empower and help you to live this life of wisdom and to embrace his instructions and to make him the goal of life and to listen to his counsel all along the journey. And I will make one guarantee. You will live a life without regret. You will discover that there's more ample blessings, greater joy, greater uh, provisions than ever before. God will do it. And so let us pray as we close the service today. Father, I just thank you this morning for the power of your word and the power of your spirit residing in your word that brings life to it and shows us the pathway of life, gives us a way to live, it instructs us, it corrects us when we're gonna deviate from that path. Lord, I pray today that those that are struggling, and we all are to some measure with the current circumstances that we're living, and I pray today, Father, that we will be strengthened by your spirit in our innermost being, that we will, Lord, be strengthened by Christ who is dwelling within us. Father, that you will empower our lives to do what is right and honoring and pleasing in your sight, that we, Father, will become like bright and shining stars in a world that seems to be dimming day by day, that, Lord, our light would reflect the glory of your grace and presence to the world around us. Father, I pray that you'd pour encouragement into the life of your people. I pray, Lord, that you would pour grace into the hearts that are longing and crying out, I want to know this beautiful Savior, this wonderful God who is defined as love itself. The one who demonstrated that love in such a profound way by laying down his life for us so that we might experience and find life. I pray, Father, today that you would open our hearts to you. I pray today that your spirit would refresh us, strengthen, and bless us, O oh God. I pray that our ears would be open to instruction and where we need correction that we would not resist 
and argue it away, but the Lord, that we would respond in humility and grace and say, Father, forgive me and help me, Lord, to do the right thing. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you're listening this morning, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're, you know, you're tuning in and you're going, wow, this is so interesting, all that's being said. And you know, I would like more information. I would like to know a little bit more about who God really is and what he can really do in my life. And if you're that person, I want to just encourage you to click that says for more information. Please contact us and we would love to communicate with you and help you in this journey called life. God bless you as you leave today. Thank you again so much for tuning in with us today. We loved sharing this time with you. I hope that this message impacted you in some way and you're actually leaving with some takeaways today. Absolutely. And if you do have some takeaways, turn to your spouse, turn to your kids, whoever's around you right now and say, what was your greatest takeaway from that message or two takeaways or three? Um, and just spend this time sharing with your family. Uh, or if you don't have anyone with you right now, call up a friend who you know is listening and, and find out how they respond responded to the sermon. You can also let us know how you responded on our website and Facebook pages. Thanks. Have a great one.